hominids have been around for millions of years. Homo sapiens, a couple hundred thousand. But it was just 50,000 years ago that human culture started to flourish. This is what some called the Great Leap Forward. Prior to that, humans were culturally primitive and not too different from other hominids. Perhaps it was around then that we first learned to communicate and share ideas worth spreading. Communication is the encoding of information, transmission, and decoding. Breakthroughs in communication mark turning points in history. Oracy, the ability to speak and listen, was one of the first advances in communication. But it had its limitations. A spoken word is ephemeral and local. It can only be heard the moment it is spoken and only as far as the voice can project it. Written language marked the next great advancement. Literacy, the ability to read and write, is a fundamental skill today, but it took humans tens of thousands of years to get there. Though proto-writings start to surface about 9,000 years ago, it was about 4,500 years ago that the first proper writing system, cuneiform, arrived in Mesopotamia. Its impact was profound. Ideas travel not just across a room, but across communities, continents, and generations. Numeracy, the ability to count and compute, is another skill we either struggle with or take for granted. Without numeracy, we couldn't keep track of things like the sheep out to pasture or the money in our bank. Baking bread or powering a rocket relies on exacting quantifications and calculations. You probably first learned to count on your fingers. But before numbers had been invented, humans could still count. They just had to rely on devices to represent data in the absence of numbers. Sumerian counting tokens from about 8,000 BC are an example of such device. A clay counting token could represent something like sheep. These proto-hard disks weighed several kilos and encoded a few bytes of data at best. Around 3,500 BC to much fanfare, the great-grandfather of the iPad was released, the clay tablet. It was a magical device. Words, pictures, and dozens of bytes of information in a device you could hold in your hands. You may not find numbers sexy, but to the ancient Sumerians, numbers were sexagesimal. That is, they counted in 60s. This system originated around 3100 BC and survives in the way we measure time or angles. It was also the first known positional counting system. Chinese numbers surfaced around 1400 BC, but they were not positional. To write the auspicious number 888 takes five characters, not three. Roman numbers showed up around 800 BC, but it gets worse. One needs 12 characters to write 888. Try simple addition with Roman numbers and you can see why a positional system is useful. The Arabic numbers we use today can be traced back to Brahmi numbers from India, but they too were not positional. After 800 years of tinkering, Indians would rediscover positional notation, allowing for great advances in mathematics. Even so, it would take another thousand years for the printing press to arrive and help popularize Arabic numbers in the West. Oracy, literacy, and numeracy were great developments in communication. They allowed us to encode ideas into words and quantities into numbers. They allowed us to escape our primitive origins. In the early 1800s, the three R's, reading, writing, and reckoning, or arithmetic as you may know it, entered the popular vernacular and would set the foundation of early education for many generations to come. The three R's can be reduced to literacy and numeracy, but what about visual communication? There's much we can communicate with shapes, colors, and images. Graphics can convey emotional content. Think of a picture or a memorable ad. But graphics can also communicate literal information and quantitative data. Art, the fourth R, if you will, was not considered an essential skill. Yet Einstein himself said, I very rarely think in words at all. I have it in a sort of survey, in a way visually. Mere words and numbers can be stumbling blocks for truly expansive thinking, just as Roman numbers are to simple math. Graphicacy is that third but underutilized pillar in communication. Although maps and diagrams have been around for thousands of years, the bar chart was only recently invented by William Playfair in 1786. 
15 years later, he would introduce the first pi and area charts. Florence Nightingale created the coxcomb chart in 1857. And four years later, Charles Menard made the famous infographic of Napoleon's march on Moscow. He artfully displayed multiple dimensions of information on a single page. A few more points of interest include James Sylvester's depiction of chemical bonds, Otto Neurath's system of pictographs, and the pioneer plaque by Carl Sagan and Frank Drake. This was the first infographic designed to be read by aliens in outer space. <laughs> Making infographics in the old days was a laborious task done by hand. But today, computers can process hundreds, thousands, and even millions of data points to generate graphics on the fly. Consider the work of data visualization guru Hans Rosling. His talks combine animated bubbles with the cadences of a sportscaster. <laughs> He's become something of a rock star at TED. His graphics tell a story through thousands of data points in multiple dimensions. But where are we as a society when it comes to graphicacy? For the most part, our education system neglects it. Pictures and drawings are a frequent component in early education, but they're replaced by words and numbers almost entirely by the time we're in high school. Indeed, artsy is synonymous with frivolous. So when today's PowerPoint pundits are asked to incorporate graphics into their presentations, they often speak at the level of C-spot run. I see this all the time in my practice. I also see the graphic equivalent of run-on sentences with no clear point. <laughs> I'm often employed as graphics janitor to clean up the mess. You may have seen the Alisphere on TED.com. It's at the cutting edge of data visualization. Walking onto the deck of the Alisphere at the UC Santa Barbara is as close as I've ever come to being on the Star Trek holodeck. I wish I could immerse myself in data and swim through it the way they do. For what excites me the most is playing with large data sets. I enjoy the challenge, and my experience as a data journalist allows me to tell stories in a nonlinear fashion. I may be plotting our nation's consumption of energy with a Sankey diagram, or the shocking imbalance of subsidies given to fossil fuels over renewables in a coxcomb. I may devise ways to evaluate stock prices at a glance with a simple dot, or correlate rising executive pay with, of all things, falling stock prices in a bubble chart. The personal and professional connections between the women of Silicon Valley can be woven with arcs just as the collaboration of innovators birthing patents can be mapped across the globe. What thousands of employees say about their workplace can be navigated interactively, just as thousands of data points on presidential approval can be distilled on a single page. In the weeks before the 2008 presidential election, I wanted to counter pejoratives against Obama's circulating on the internet. I started by writing a rather lengthy email addressing the lies one by one. By the 10th page of my own tirade, I realized I had failed. Who would want to read my rantings? I knew I had to try something different. So I made an infographic. All right, it looked into the stock market's performance under Republicans and Democrats. Over the past 80 years, a $10,000 investment in the stock market would have grown to more than 300,000 under Democrat presidents. Republicans, not even 12,000. Even excluding for Hoover and the Great Depression, it only improves modestly. The graphic landed on the New York Times op-ed page just a couple weeks before the election. It went viral, being read and shared by millions. I love my job because I get to learn all sorts of new things. <laughs> I talk to fascinating people, from CEOs to NASA scientists trying to power the dark side of the moon on a laser beam. But not every project is rich with data. Graphicacy, after all, is the neglected stepchild in the classroom. So I'm often employed to illustrate relatively simple data. A better metaphor may be to think of graphicacy as the neglected grandparent. If you think about it, numeracy and literacy were born out of graphicacy. Though we may not appreciate it, the human mind has an enormous capacity to process visual information. For example, we can look at a face and almost immediately take in a wealth of information about that person. <laughs> Perhaps one day we will better understand this innate ability. From there, we invent an infobet that encodes multiple dimensions of information at a much higher bandwidth. For now, graphicacy is in the realm of a rarefied priesthood, much as literacy was in centuries past. But there's a community of explorers and enthusiasts making some 
great discoveries in previously uncharted territories. I'm excited to see the power to shift from the pulpit to the people as graphicacy gains traction. Today, we generate data at an unprecedented rate. We often feel inundated with too much information. The time has come to sharpen our visual skills. It's the best way to process and understand this bounty of information. Our schools need new curricula that incorporate all three pillars of communication, literacy, numeracy, and graphicacy. The synergy will enable quantum leaps in communication and result in breakthroughs beyond our wildest fantasies. We face serious problems, global weirding, bird flu, and financial crises, to name a few. But there are vast mountains of information attached to all of these problems. We're like our ancestors, counting herds with clay tokens or multiplying with Roman numbers. We have yet to find out the best way to encode this information, but we must. We must simplify the complex. We must find a way to sculpt data into shapes we can read and understand. Once we do, we'll find the veins of gold hidden in those mountains. Graphicacy, I contend, will be that key. It will allow us to tackle the challenges we face today, and it will be the springboard for our next, our next great leap forward.